maybe we'll have a few more join us. Um, I'm Wendy Goldberg. I'm the executive director of TriFaith. I'm so glad you're here with us today. And um, I've been thinking a lot about this word centered or centering. And um, I'm finding that people are using it a little bit differently. So um, when you think about centering um, at the beginning of a program, perhaps we're gonna take a minute to center ourselves, to um, find a calm and be present here. And um, I'll invite that in a minute. But I also want to remember, um, I was listening to um, a video from the Abrahamic Dialogue training uh, that's going on in a partnership that we're doing with UNO and Rebecca Morello from Countryside talked about centering and prayer practice as a means of kind of getting out of your own way and to realizing that our egos um, are not um, perhaps doing us good in the work um, and, and that we are able to um, center others. Um, and so as we take a minute to get centered and think about um, uh, this concept of wellness that we're going to invite today, um, if you could just take four deep breaths um, and invite that idea that perhaps um, we're all part of something bigger and how can you remove your own ego or your own self from that center. So four breaths. Thank you. So today we have uh, a special guest, um, a shout out to uh, Joe Gerstan, who is a member of our TriFaith board. He runs a group on the first Friday of each month called The Circle, which is a group of people who care about diversity, equity, and inclusion uh, work in Omaha, who gather to um, support each other, to um, train each other, um, to uh, innovate together. And um, he invited Sarah to speak to that group. And that's where I was introduced um, and was able to hear um, many of the ideas that we'll bring to you today. Um, and so I asked Sarah and Sarah, in the, in the spirit of being vulnerable, phonics is not my jam. So I'm gonna let you tell us how to say your last name. And um, you are here with us from the Wellbeing Partners, and I would love you to start with telling us um, about uh, your work. And um, I think that sometimes people uh, tell about themselves better than I could. So I'm so grateful that you're here. Um, Sarah will present to us for uh, 20 or 30 minutes at the beginning, and then um, we'll have a little conversation. And um, if you have questions, feel free to add them to the chat. Sarah, thank you for joining us. Go ahead and try that sharing again. Hi, my name is Sarah Shirley, and I have the honor of serving as the Chief Executive Officer of the Wellbeing Partners. And before I get started, I just wanted to ask, do you see a full screen slide or do you? Okay, good, wonderful. I never know if I have the right approach. So um, just toggling you a little bit about the Wellbeing Partners and myself, um, I, was an executive director of Livewell Omaha for a number of years and Livewell Omaha and Wellness Council of the Midlands decided to come together for greater impact. And our mission is to build well-being into the way communities grow and do business. And we are the well-being partners. And if you look at the W, it's a very intentional nod to sort of an MC Escher piece. It's a three-dimensional bridge. Uh, we see ourselves as bridge builders. We are conveners, we're facilitators, teachers, we want to help businesses and communities go where they want to go. And we believe that rather than having um, a separate wellness or health initiative, that if we build it in to how we are moving and working and growing, we all benefit. So that's our premise with which we work. I'm happy to be with you all today. I'm going to share a little bit of an overview of several things that we're doing in our work, just in an attempt to give you a little bit of an introduction of the organization that I so dearly love. And also just to welcome any ideas, thoughts, or questions in the conversation. So I'll go relatively quickly. 
So we believe that health again is not a pretty program or simply, yes, I've checked the box, I've worked out today, or I've taken my five minutes of meditation. We believe that well being is actually about believing in human potential, the human potential that every single person has, and it is a secret ingredient to our growth as an economy, as competitive talent at the workplace level, the makeup of our vibrant neighborhoods and that equity inclusion is a key to ensuring that all people and places thrive. We believe that, that the universe has abundance to kind of speak your language in more of a, um, of a, a mindfulness approach and that when we ensure that all people and places thrive, everyone continues to thrive. So I think that's a nice shift. Our values, our impact, and so we make sure that our strategic plans are very measurable. We report out to our members, we report out to board, our partners, et cetera, and they help us co-create those things. Equity, so a lot of our work will focus on either workplaces or populations or zip codes where we know that extra help is needed due to um, other maybe past inequities um, or disadvantages. Um, integrity. So how we describe this is radical candor with one another and within our board. So having those difficult conversations, especially even working remotely, um, just this morning with a colleague, she emailed me and said, you know, I didn't intend that to sound in this way. And I said, well, email's terrible for tone and I didn't mean it in that way either. So, hey, let's talk next Thursday, right? So that's just a, a good demonstration of that integrity. Relationship is, uh, we would rather plant a relationship today and let it grow over the next 10 to 15 years rather than maximizing and pumping out sales um, in the short term. And innovation, we're a learning organization. So we feel forward, we talk openly about those things and we use those to learn and grow and move in the next direction. So I talked a little bit about Stronger Together. The Wellness Council of the Midlands had been around since 1984, and they were completely focused on workplace well-being and what a great expertise. Also an amazing cadre of Fortune 500 companies and lots of the big companies that um, you know and love in our community. Livewell had been around since 1996, founded by the Sisters of Mercy and the Douglas County Health Department, and then many founding organizations that you all know and love as well. Um, and that group was doing community uh, well-being work. Again, based in the same science and um, doing very complimentary work, but sometimes in silos. So anywho, those folks came together and that's what you see here today. So getting to the science of it, how does this work that all people thrive, right? At the basis of health, you've probably read in many of published works over the last five or six years that the number one determinant of our health is actually our zip code, which is a very jarring um, realization because how many of us are in control of the zip codes we live in at whatever level because we're born into them or we're just from Nebraska or we're from Iowa or what have you. But we know from the science that the living conditions, the fancy term is socioeconomic factors, but I'll just say living conditions, um, such as access to healthy foods, access to preventive care, employment equality, connected accessible transportation, your relationships and your support network, social support is huge, uh, financial well-being, healthy and affordable housing, quality education, and a safe, connected community, thereby that we can get around and we can do the things that we need in our community. They are the basis of health. And when we support those factors, we support healthier choices. Um, for those of us who are privileged to have a lot of crayons in our crayon box on any given day, we can more readily choose those healthy behaviors. For individuals who maybe are missing some of these healthy living conditions, choosing those healthy behaviors is a lot more difficult. When we choose the healthy behaviors, we prevent the top four chronic diseases, cancer, heart disease and stroke, lung disease, and type two diabetes. Those are the top four chronic diseases that are present within adults within Douglas, Sarpy, Cass, and Pottawatomie counties. Um, and we know that the, the um, average life expectancy in the US is 78.93, which um, is much less than other developed countries. And so we just round that up to a good old fashioned 79 and beyond. <laughs> so let's all live to age 79 and beyond. And when we know that we close the gap in life expectancy, we bring equity and inclusion and thriving to our community. So in Douglas County alone, there's about a 12.3 year life expectancy gap um, between one zip code and a zip code and another. And if you think about just compound interest over a 12 year period, it's really a matter of health and also economics. So by increasing life expectancy, our quality of life, um, our economy, our talent pool, um, our communities grow.
Any questions so far? Feel free to interrupt as, as I go. I'm happy to do that. So within the, the centering activity, I just had to show this diagram of this is our practice. Um, because if we focus too much on one of these dimensions, the other dimensions will have an impact on us. And there also, it's impossible to simultaneously focus on all these things at once. And so I think the spiritual practice that you all are connected within, as well as you know, intellectual, social support, et cetera, have so many of these dimensions of well-being. And so if you look at these, different ones may speak differently to you. I think the occupational one is what the well-being partners is most excited to really talk about. Um, because we do think that purpose and mental well-being drives a lot of the behaviors and health outcomes that we experience. So this is the team that I have the privilege to work with. Um, of course, I'm there, but um, all kinds of amazing folks who are really driving work on the community side and workplace side. We shape into in what we do within three buckets, solve, change, and achieve. Within solve, that delineates our member programs and services. We are a membership-based organization. Um, and we try to find a space really for everyone. Change involves the systems changes and interventions that we're doing that we'll talk a little bit more about. And then achieve is really about shining the light on those companies and even individual leaders who are just setting the standard. They've implemented policies, protocols, culture, they're leading out there in the world and showing others that it is possible and that they want to follow suit. So I won't go through the long litany of lists but essentially we exist to make sure that businesses can first invest in their own health and wellness of their teams. We believe that change comes from the inside out. And so the solve component is engaging in member meetings with us, um, receiving an organizational assessment report. We have some consulting time built in for each of our companies um, and organizations. We do have many nonprofits. We have entrepreneurs in our network. It isn't just for big businesses. It's really businesses of all size. Um, we have monthly e-newsletters and lots of networking opportunities. I think that's been ever crucial within the pandemic. Change, I'll talk a little bit about some of the change management initiatives that we are engaging in currently. One is the Regional Health Council. We currently work with Douglas, Sarpy, Cass, and Potawatomi Health Departments on a focus to reduce mental health stigma across those counties. We know that it is rampant in workplaces, in social situations, um, family, in, within families, I can't say that right now. Um, and so we're working on a promotion campaign that I'll talk about in a minute. We also work with Share Our Table, which is a food security coalition across the counties. And those folks are working on all kinds of things, but namely to increase the distribution of fresh fruits and vegetables within a pilot location in Southeast Omaha called Las Nenas. Um, so that is going on there. We do a lot of work with schools currently. So we've been running Partners for Healthy Schools, I wanna say for 10 years. We've impacted all kinds of schools and essentially it's focused on supporting guidance counselors, teachers, principals who are, who are those change agents to make healthy policy changes. So some examples are um, giving more open access to water, which has been hard for kiddos during the pandemic in schools or not withholding recess for punishment because we know for kiddos who might be receiving punishment at school, they really need recess more than maybe other kids. Um, recess before lunch is always a best practice too to make sure that folks can um, get out their wiggles and be able to actually be hungry. So those are some evidence-based policies that we follow within the, the school index. Um, the second is safe routes to school. So we know that um, currently there are fewer kiddos biking, walking, and rolling because again, from the inclusion standpoint of if someone is in a wheelchair, um, that, that folks you know, need to have access to their schools by foot or by bike or by wheelchair. And so we look within a half mile of the school, help the school run their own approach to mapping that area any safe places, if there are McGruff houses in the area, et cetera. Anywho, we help them map it and then we help do a promotional thing within the school to get more folks activated. And then we, um, we tally it to see the impact. The last piece is we, we've only worked with one neighborhood um, and, and we'll see where we move forward on this, but we worked with the Highlander neighborhood 
Um, and we essentially looked at this crosswalk in the picture is actually right in front of Highlander um, across North 30th. What, what does the safety look like within a half mile radius of the Highlander neighborhood since it was brand new and it's gorgeous and it's just fantastic. How are we keeping people safe as they go to Charles Drew, as they go across to access services at Walgreens, et cetera. And what we found was um, it traffic is way, way too fast. There is now a road diet that went in there. Um, and the crosswalk that my colleague Sheena is crossing there was actually um, a win for the neighborhood is we helped build the civic muscle of the neighborhood so they could advocate for their crosswalk and make sure that there was a crosswalk there that was painted because we know that when cars actually see those things painted on the pavement partnered with a sign, they will be more aware and they, more, they are more apt to slow down. The other win for the neighbors was they were able to lengthen the signal at North 30th right by that Vallejo gas station, if you know the area, because the signal was just way too short for anyone to cross. So those are big wins in the community advocacy space. Within the Achieve space, um, each year we celebrate Trek Up the Tower this is a wonderful way to talk about the individual journey of, um, of becoming more physically active and just the practice of being with self and being connected to our bodies and training for something. So First National Bank of Omaha is our longtime partner for that. And folks trek up that tower for the well-being partners and all the proceeds goes towards our mission. Um, and unfortunately, we are doing it virtual this year, although I shouldn't say unfortunately, it's going to be fantastic. So we'll talk more about that. It will launch um, on May 8th, but it won't conclude until May 29th. And the nice part about that is we're actually getting more young families and individuals with different physical abilities to participate with us because there's lots of ways to track those steps over the course of a couple weeks. So making lemonade out of lemons. Um, the wellness gala that we typically have is in October of this year, and that will also be um, potentially in person. Honestly, the jury is out on that right now. And our exchange conference will be virtual. Exchange is a professional development conference for all of our members and other folks who um, are purchasing tickets. So these are what our events look like, and, and you'll probably be hearing about more of those as um, you hopefully follow us on Facebook and Twitter and Instagram. So where do we serve? Today we serve Douglas, Pottawatomie, Sarpy, and Cass counties. We also serve Polk County out of Des Moines. We are growing into Nebraska and Iowa. Um, the, what the pandemic has taught us is we can still continue a high touch, very relationship-based model, but more virtual. And so we'll continue to do that to make sure if a member from South Dakota wants to join, they are more than welcome. So a little bit more about COVID now that I've shared with you um, the backdrop of the well-being partners. A couple of caveats here that I shared with the HR group as well is I am not Dr. Poor from the Douglas County Health Department. She's on my board um, and she's fantastic. But what I'm going to share with you is really more the workplace view of that or how we are responding as a nonprofit in today's situation. So any questions about vaccinations, I'm sure Wendy could triage those or about COVID. Um, I'm happy to triage those back to the Douglas County Health Department. But I did update these stats. I didn't update the date on top. Um, and I just wanted to start there in sort of, um, to borrow your word, Wendy, centering in just the impact of this. I think that because many of us have been maybe experiencing this in isolation or at home with our little tribes, our communities, our little pods or whatever we're calling them, um, I think sometimes we don't have a big enough reverence for what this impact really is. Um, the story that I always go back to is I remember buying the, the front page of the New York Times when 100,000 names, people had died from COVID. And I remember that I felt it was my duty to read each one and just sort of have a moment. And now for the United States, we're at, um, let's see, you know, 484,379 deaths of people who are giving amazing things. Again, back to that talent and, and, um, the talent that everyone is born with, the positivity that everyone's born with, and we're missing that. And what we also know, um, I guess I can go back and forth here, is unfortunately COVID across the country, and we are no different, um, is disproportionately impacting people of color, of African American individuals, Latino individuals, other um, other races, and, and in some pockets, um, Caucasian individuals, but this is just a sample, and this was actually taken back in January, is you can see some of the zip codes that are popping up here in the western part of Douglas County, which was fairly new. But when you actually hover over 68104, which is I believe where this is coming from here, um, you can see 68% in this case Hispanic. 
which is not the preferred term. So I'll use the term Latino um, or Latinx. But just to kind of even sit with that a moment, that the health inequities that we know are rampant in our community and are not okay, are then amplified when something like COVID shows up. And that's not even talking about the living conditions folks are experiencing. So to go back to this, um, as you can see, Iowa has tested way more people than Nebraska. And I think that there's something to that. And so their numbers are a little bit higher. Um, we also have fewer deaths associated with that. And so, you know, make whatever conclusion you want there. I think just a nod to the heroes at Douglas, Sarpy, Cass, and Pottawatomie County Health Departments, um, send them love notes because they hear from a lot of people who don't think that they uh, are working hard enough and they are working nearly 24 hours a day to keep us safe and to keep call centers going and to fight for as many tests and vaccinations as they can. Um, and truly they do it through the name of public health. Um, and so they're an amazing um, example of public service. And so if you have a moment to just send some sort of a positive note to any of the health departments, they will be very grateful. I wanted to tell a story about the Refugee Empowerment Center that just centers on um, how COVID has impacted in particular um, different communities at a much higher level. And so um, I, I tell this out of respect, I serve with the executive director, Amanda Kohler of the Refugee Empowerment Center um, on a mayoral COVID advisory. And what she shared one day was um, for a group of individuals within their network um, who typically pull together to fund one another's funerals. There were so many funerals within a two month period that money had run out. So it was on Amanda's um, priority list to go out to funders and say, can you help us fund these funerals from um, individuals um, who typically could handle that within their social network because there was such an impact. And what is the central factor? What's the living condition at the root of this beyond COVID? It was employer. So this is where we move into um, inequities within employers. So we are able at the Wellbeing Partners to work mostly remotely and to have a very um, generous time off policy. We are actually able to mirror UNO's policy of giving 80 hours of COVID leave to employees if they were a care provider of someone who had COVID or if they themselves had COVID, which has really come in handy this year for the team. Um, because for my team, this has impacted every single family, every single one of us. We've either had COVID or our family member has had it or someone whom we're caring for. Um, but back to individuals that, that the Refugee Empowerment Center was working with, they were largely employees of meatpacking plants who were not provided those protections, who were not provided sick leave, who were not, not cared for. Um, and unfortunately, um, that's, that's what we're seeing in lots of spaces. Um, has anyone read the articles about, um, actually now there are two Tyson cases. Um, one was executives unfortunately taking bets on how many individuals on their Tyson factory floor, this was in Iowa, um, were going to get sick or die from COVID and they were actually pooling money. Um, there you go. And then there was another instance actually in Council Bluffs here within the Tyson factory of um, workers reporting that they were not able to receive new PPE for each shift. And so they were having to show up and use masks that were already laden with blood. And it makes me teary-eyed every time I talk about it. Um, Cause no one should have to feed their families and be in an environment like that. And so that's why I think it's really important that groups like you exist and that you care to learn about these things and that you care to pick up your pen and write letters and, and join things so that way we can do better um, because everyone deserves a healthy um, supported workplace. So sorry, I always get tired when I talk about that. I could not even imagine um, just the length that, that uh, UNOCEC has gone through to protect people and institute new policies and put up all of the posters to educate us and make sure that we're doing an app as we arrive at the building. It's just amazing. It's so incredible and just a nod to, to UNO in general for that. Um, but, but could we even imagine if that's how we had to get our paycheck and that's the choice? Like I either need to go and be unsafe or choose not to work in this space and not receive the income. Um, within the realm of being part of the solution, the Wellbeing Partners was honored to receive a grant through the CARES Act funding through Douglas County. 
and we've shaped a TWP Cares toolkit and website. So it's at twpcares.org. This is available for anyone to use. So feel free if it uh, plays within one of the faith communities that you participate in or a nonprofit or wherever. Um, we also are happy to switch out a logo here and there if, if that helps anybody, but it's out on the website right now. It's an amazing toolkit of resources. And what I'm really proud about is there are resources fully in English and fully in Spanish. So there's actually uh, two different websites. And then additionally, there is a library of, I want to say 12 languages of these resources that can be printed out. Um, so that's pretty incredible. We've never been able to provide support at that level, um, but we know again that it's very much needed within spaces that quite frankly did not receive health promotion in the language that individuals speak or even read. So this one around uh, wearing a face mask and the other around using social distancing in elevators. This is just a screenshot of the website and where you can find that. So that, that's how we're responding in the way that we can. We've also, we have a whole resource library on our website for our current members to try to help them do their best practice. And we have provided some TA for very small businesses who needed those resources. Um, what I think cannot be lost here because we know of the physical tolls of the pandemic um, and of, of either just experiencing isolation in the pandemic or um, recovering from COVID, but we know in the literature that these things are linked. So as we think about mental well-being, um, as we think about the dimensions of wellness and how we're caring for ourselves, I think some data is really imperative to take a look at together. And one is pandemic causes spike in anxiety and depression. And these are of adults who may or may not have experienced COVID, but are certainly experiencing a very heightened uh, depression and anxiety if we compare January to June to um, the time, of, of course, where we all decided to shift. There is evidence that of individuals who are recovering from COVID-19, and many, maybe some of you on this call have experienced this, have experienced severe mental illness in the recovery process. Um, brain fog, depression, anxiety, difficulty sleeping, et cetera. And so this is a, a resource that talks about that. Um, this last piece is really more around, again, the impact within mental health. So feeling isolated from others before COVID and then after COVID, right? Feeling left out, feeling depressed or hopeless, little interest in doing things, can't stop worrying, feeling nervous or anxious. And that's from the National Mental Health Fund. So again, I, I don't want to leave you depressed and all of that. I think it's it's a good element to be aware of. I think it's for the Midwest, I know before I started personally working within this mental well-being space, I'll just talk about my family, we didn't talk about mental health and we didn't check in with one another in that way. We sure do now. It's definitely much more a part of our language, but it wasn't really a part of our culture. And I would argue that um, as a Midwesterner my entire life, that maybe it's not a part of many other family cultures. And how do we continue to open up the conversation with those conversation starters that say, hey, it's okay to talk about this. It's okay to have a day or a week or a month where you're not okay. And how do we just hold space for one another and hold those conversations that are supportive and connecting rather than divisive or um, isolating? So to that end, um, I'm happy to share with you that we have partnered with um, Mutual of Omaha Foundation, Sherwood Foundation, as well as CHI Health and other funders to bring uh, this community campaign called What Makes Us? Because we believe that depending upon whether or not the diagnosis is bipolar or ADHD or um, autism or depression or anxiety, some of these are categorized as mental um, illnesses. Some of these are categorized as neurodivergencies. And then there's also folks who are coping within substance abuse disorders, right? So it's all there. It's all there on, on our minds and within our lives, but it is those unique experiences and the resilience of each of us that really makes us who we are. Um, we have to love all of it, right? Even though that's often difficult. So what makes us is essentially a campaign of allies and those um, who also are telling their stories about themselves. So the goal is by July, 2021, that we together <clears throat> tell enough stories within workplaces, within families, on social media, 
in a lot of community organizing that we're doing among barbershops, salons, and faith communities to just get the conversation stirring about, hey, mental health is a thing. And it's, it's a health dimension, just like physical health. So just like you ask somebody, hey, are you working out? At the level um, of comfort, we should say, hey, do you see a therapist? Yeah, sometimes I do. Yeah, it's a helpful resource for me. It's a tool in my toolbox, right? Um, and so these are actual examples. Um, this gentleman is a reporter from KETV Newswatch 7, and he willingly shared his story um, uh, about his approach. And then this is Stephanie Bell on the right, and she is an employee of Mutual of Omaha, and she also serves on one of our working committees. And she um, is a mom of, of uh, boys, I believe, who struggle with substance abuse disorder. And in her journey of supporting them and being a great mom, but also providing that self-care as well. So those are just two of the, um, I believe we have 89 stories already. So consider sharing yours as well. We also are sharing back with folks. This is not just a, a take, this is a feedback loop piece. So we take pulse panel, um, quick surveys of the community to say, hey, what do you wanna hear more about? What are you really struggling with and how do we provide you those resources? We also share little fun memes like this on social media that our member organizations and anyone who's interested really can reach out to us and share these so that way they can be part of the conversation. So I love this one on the right. This came out around the Christmas time. Uh, or Christmas holiday, but try some yoga to start your holiday. Better yet, invite your household to join you, which is just sweet. I love that. So this is the website for What Makes Us. So whatmakesus.com slash US. Um, and again, please reach out to myself, reach out to the team, or just go to that website and fill out the form. But you could submit a photo of your story and how you have um, experienced life throughout maybe a diagnosis and that we of course are not the diagnosis, as well as maybe you've been an ally of a friend or a family member who has experienced something and how you really stood strong with them. There is a parallel campaign that I didn't wanna spend as much time on, but just to share with you, for folks who maybe are not at the point where they want to um, engage in learning about allies or specific mental, um, mental health diagnoses, there is a pet campaign that's still about mental health, but in a super cute way. Um, and it's sharing a photo of your pet and then uh, what makes your pet special. And then essentially it is copywritten in a very cute and clever way on Instagram to talk about why the pet is great, right? So my pet June is my running dog and that's part of my mental health. And so she runs me and if we don't do it, I don't stop hearing about it. Um, and so that's, that's one of my built-in um, support systems. So uh, consider submitting your pet as well. Any questions? I went very quickly through a lot of things. Okay, I will just wrap up here. Essentially, we have some upcoming opportunities, shameless promotion, I couldn't help it. Uh, we do have a virtual well-being forum on March 16th, and it will be completely focused on mental well-being. So we have some really incredible speakers that we'll be promoting on social media coming up. Um, as well as if you're interested in doing a community member work group around mental well-being and the mental health stigma reduction campaign, um, Mika, our colleague, is the campaign coordinator of that work. She does incredible work, and her email is there, Mika at the wellbeingpartners.org, and um, she can connect you to the next meeting. The final shameless plug is Trek Up the Tower. This is our theme, which is done each year by Bozell, and we really appreciate that. It is a lovely postcard theme. Wish we were here because we wish we were in the first National Bank Tower, but it just isn't gonna work this year with COVID. So um, again, it will be a virtual event, activating people where they feel comfortable, mostly outside, uh, but this is a fun postcard and you can register starting in March at trekupthetower.org. And here's my contact information. Thank you for the time today. Sure, thank you. Oh, you're not done. I got lots of questions. Um, here, maybe we can uh, stop sharing the screen so that um, we can see everyone and maybe others will be brave and, and join the conversation, I, I hope so. Um, but I, I, I have a couple of questions. Um, my, my first is, um, you know, I, I hear your passion for, um, this big concept of supporting um, people in their workplace um, to to find balance across these these uh, spectrum of of wellness. Um, 
and then we're all human, right? So like what, what on your journey this year has um, been something that you have celebrated um, related to that and, and what maybe on a more personal way is something that you're struggling with? Good question. I think as a triumph, as a new organization, which is recycled from two very historic organizations, um, we had to walk the walk over the last year and a half, year and few months, um, which is how do we build a positive supportive culture in a pandemic when many of us didn't know each other well in person yet, um, virtually? And what does that look like and how do we engage in courageous conversations <clears throat> as we're creating and building. Um, and I don't think any culture is ever done, of course, but I can say that just from employee feedback, I ask for that every year when I'm evaluated, um, we are getting there and by and large people feel that way. So I think that's probably the biggest win is we soon will be able to have more impact with our member organizations and out in the community because we are uh, building the right tools and supporting each other throughout life. I think the biggest personal struggle for me is that I love structure and I love work a lot, um, but I'm a mom of three. I have twin girls who are five. I have a little guy who's three. And just the, um, the dissolve of any barrier between, um, I'm blessed to be in the office today, but sometimes that's not the case. And so, you know, I think work-life blend is a challenge, right? And how long can you work at 10 p.m. at night without burning out? And I had to learn that the hard way at the beginning of the pandemic. Um, and now I found a little bit more of a balance, but I don't like that part at all. <laughs> Not one little bit. Um, and it has forced me to have a level of vulnerability with my board and my team that I, I wouldn't have willingly offered um, to, to show my coworkers um, be in five, right? Or be in three and just being kids and, and having to merge that at the same time. So I think that's been the absolute biggest struggle. What I did learn through that is loosen up a little bit things will get done. Uh, they will move forward. Um, and it will happen. Like have faith, essentially, just slow down the, the beat a little bit, slow down the pace and, and have faith and it will get done. Um, it won't be as rigid and, and as separated as I prefer. Um, but the new way can be just as beautiful with different cycles of productivity and rest. Thank you. Um, I love Nasser's question. Thank you for being here, Nasser. Um, first, he's appreciating your work and your presentation. And then um, mental uh, disease stigmas vary among cultures and certainly on the intersection of culture, religion, and race, I think is, you know, very gender, you know, uh, intersectional identity, right? That it, it's, it's, it, um, it's not the same for any two people. So how do you address that uh, within a diverse population in Omaha, or, or, or how do you hope to? Yeah, I don't know that we could ever say we've absolutely tackled that. The intention is that folks who are taking our pulse panel polls to tell us what to do and how to message, um, we're oversampling for individuals who are representative of key communities that we know um, have cultural challenges with talking about mental health. Um, and then it's also lifting up the testimonial voices. So we're never putting, we're, we're putting tips out there um, at a certain level, but a bulk of the campaign is really people telling their own stories in their own words. And we think that is the most important, not necessarily getting the evidence-based whatever out there. It's, hey, this person looks like me, this person sounds like me, and I can connect to that. Um, as part of that, we are really excited to be working with community organizers who, again, are um, representative and um, residents of key communities that we want to reach. Um, so one individual is Spanish speaking and lives in um, Southeast Omaha. One individual um, is African American and has a lot of faith connections and is really focusing there. And so we're working through individuals who have lived experience and have that translational ability that I wouldn't have um, in those communities to be our eyes and ears and connective resource, but it's just getting started. We have a lot to learn and a lot to do. Um, thank you. Um, I, I'm curious in the, in the workplace, um, the, uh, th this question that, that, 
that I feel as a supervisor, um, I imagine other people do as well. And, and that's that when I ask my team, how are you today? There's a fine line between, am I asking you, how are you as a human being? And am I asking you, are you gonna get your work done? Um, and I think that's harder in COVID and working remotely and me missing seeing their faces. Um, but you know what, I, I don't know, how, how are you seeing people do that? And, and you know, and, and EAP is, is just not enough in, in this world that we're living in. So um, what are some of your, what have you learned about that? We're learning a lot from our member organizations. So we're trying certain things, but just to share out, um, we just had a member share earlier this week with Duke University and some other partners, Grinnell Mutual out of Iowa. Um, and they're really doing some inspiring things. Um, they're, they've done, for example, a 10 day stress challenge through a partner where folks were just asked to spend some meditation time on the clock and just monitor maybe their stress pre and post and engage in some readings, engage in some social connections. Um, so there are some programmy things that you can do. I think from a fundamental perspective, um, how are you today is a tough question. I think that especially within the workplace that may not open um, conversation in the way that we always want it to. Um, and some questions to try maybe a little bit differently are, um, are you holding tension in your body today in any, in any one place, right? And they might say, ah, oh, my neck is really hurting. Oh, tell me about that, right? And so it's more of that motivational interviewing space or um, you know, bef just carving out in those one-on-one -on -one times. I know that we have to carve out a lot more time actually than if we were in person to, to connect personally to get the job done because this work, just as many of your um, volunteer roles or professional roles, is very um, energy consuming, right? So we have to make sure that we're in touch with how are we here before we actually go and do the work. So, um, oh, I might've lost the second question I was gonna share with you. So where are you holding tension today? Um, what's your energy like today? That's, a, that's another question. Um, there are some continuums I'm happy to share in the follow-up of, um, are you feeling more in the red zone today? Or are you feeling more in the green zone today? So there's some continuums of like, Hey, I'm, I'm really happy. I'm thriving or I'm under stress or I'm in critical mode. And so those are some of the words that we use often internally to just say, um, Hey, what is going on? Um, and I think back to that radical candor piece around productivity, we have set really clear roadmap goals for individuals and we do round on the roadmap components, but what we've had to set up and do simply to maintain our culture and operate in this new environment is um, always assuming positive intent and just making sure that we're hitting those milestone meetings. And if we're doing that, the conversation can be more about development and growth and how to be present with one another. And we build in the other mechanisms to handle sort of the nuts and bolts on an ongoing basis. And that's not always, um, helpful for bigger teams. We have a team of eight. And so that is helpful because we have two division directors who are in touch with those folks. Um, but I do think a nod to different types of questions that get people to think, oh, this person really does care. And this isn't just like a quick, hey, how you doing? Where you're like, yeah, I'm good. Um, and then also mechanisms by which virtually milestones and measures are just built into the way that the business is running. So that way that is on a track but that doesn't always have to be what the, the in-person interactions are on Zoom or phone, via phone call. Thank you. I, I don't wanna step over anyone else. Is anyone ready to unmute and ask a question? I have a really tough question. Oh, Anne, I love your questions, you go. <laughs> But it's more of just to kind of open the dialogue for it. So it's not, you know, like I'm trying to call you out or anything. Um, I love uh, some of the examples you gave. Uh, I personally work with the question, how are you, right? Everybody avoids it, they gloss over it um, and they don't have the vocabulary. We haven't developed that to even begin to talk about that, right? And so I think for years now, 
wellness in, in businesses has done a good job of highlighting strategies, whether it's a month or a week to do something. And my question lies with how do we begin to move from the strategies to building the culture? And I know it takes time, right? But um, just curious what other people think about that. And it's, it's tough, right? It's a lot of work. Um, but just curious to what anybody has to share about that. Thank you. Anyone have any thoughts or ideas for responding to Anne or a place that you've seen that work or not? I guess that's the work that we're doing, right? Is 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 building the culture. And you know, Sarah, that's for you too. With the, the people that you work with, um, how do you begin to you know, move from those strategies to get someone to highlight mindfulness for a week to, to building the culture with the leaders. Um, you know, it seems like we ask our staff to do these things and participate, um, but sometimes we don't have like the whole workplace, I guess, I guess leading it. Maybe I'm answering my own question, but. Yeah, I think the culture of health, um, and the CDC writes a lot about that. Um, our, our WJF, Robert Johnson Foundation, writes a lot about that. So if, as people are interested, please look those folks up and look at their readings. Um, I think that is the ultimate goal. And, and yet the challenge is, even when you think that you're there within initiatives and policies and protocol and having some ambassadors and leaders buy into it, um, it is still a challenge because the leadership can shift or the profitability can shift. And then abundance, uh, orientation towards abundance may not be as much there. Um, and then wellness programs and the culture may not be as prioritized. And so that is an ongoing concern. That's what we're really excited about diving into that. We have one manufacturing company among our membership, Henningsen Foods, and they're diving into some really interesting planning and support systems. Um, we have, we have some amazing companies who I would say really do have a pretty high culture of health to some degree. Um, and how do we go and help additional industries? So I don't have a, a perfect answer for your question by any means, but I think that's certainly the ongoing goal. I would also pair with that in this mental health space is psychologically safe workplace. I think that's the other workplace co component of this mental health stuff is how do we create workplaces where an employee could feel comfortable hopping on a Zoom with you and saying, you know that email you sent me last week, it just really bothered me. Or, um, you know, what's going on here? It, just from that perspective, because we don't even realize that in some of these interactions from micro interactions, they sort of domino effect beyond the, the half-life that they really need to have. And so I think it does start with what specific mindful actions can we have in a psychologically safe workplace? And then how do we just build that in as a standard of practice in all the dimensions of well-being? Um, that's a loaded charge, but uh, such important work. Um, I, I'm curious, particularly given um, tri-faith in our, our model of um, being exposed to the other, particularly the religious other. And when, we, when you talk about the intersection of um, occupational health and spiritual health and um, and my whole life that I was taught, you aren't allowed to talk about religion or politics in the workplace. And so um, we had a post on our social media this week that said, um, if we're not allowed to talk about politics or religion in the workplace, um, why is that so? Why wouldn't we teach people how to have difficult conversations? Um, and perhaps those are, that's the toolkit that we're kind of missing. So um, I'm curious, um, if you are witnessing any organizations that you think have a culture of an intersection of um, spiritual practice beyond perhaps a meditation room um, that, um, or, or anyone who you think is, is doing good work um, in that intersection. 
to be honest, Wendy, I don't think we ask enough about that, the spiritual intersection. And so beyond um, some of the faith-based health system providers who build in kind of the mission moments and those sorts of things, I don't have a great answer. I'm happy to take a look a little bit more deeply among our members and get back to you though. Yeah, and, and I think what we find is um, those mission mo moments end up to be an opportunity for a very powerful Christian voice um, to be heard again. Um, and, and that's not said with disrespect or that there aren't beautiful things to learn from, from that. It's just um, um, continued power. Um, uh, Lachelle. Um, yeah, I was just going to say, and I liked your what you just mentioned about not being able to talk about politics and religion in the workplace. And I will say this, I think it's great to talk about those things in the workplace, but I think we also have to leave space for people who don't want to talk about those things in the workplace or don't feel comfortable about it. Um, Cause like when I was at one of my previous companies, the whole kind of culture thing was very important. And there are a lot of people who just see their job is just that it's just a job. This is my work. You're not my friends. I want to come and do my job, get paid and then be done for the day. Um, and I almost felt like, those employees in some ways. I don't want to say they were discriminated against, but you could obviously say they had a harder time like advancing and getting promoted because they weren't kind of, you know, playing the games or were deemed as a culture fit. So sometimes I don't think it's necessarily even coming from the top. I think there's a lot of people who just don't want to talk about those things in the workplace for whatever reasons. Yeah. Can I make a I, um, I think that one reason, and I know that sometimes we have rules about not doing that, not talking about those things, but so many times, unfortunately, those types of conversations lead to unpleasantness. And so I think that's probably why um, particular, particularly uh, when people are discussing politics. If they're discussing religion, probably not. They might be interested in somebody else's religion. And unless somebody's trying to proselytize, is that the word, to them and, you know, and sh tell them that they're going to go to hell if this, you know, that type of thing. That, that can lead to unpleasantness. A lot of times discussing religion is just, it's an interesting thing to do. But oftentimes, particularly probably in the last uh, four years, if we get into those types of uh, discussions, it can lead to arguments and you can't have that. So it's kind of, what do you do and what do you don't, you know? Um, yeah, they're having a hard time kind of figuring out where those boundaries are. Uh, yes. In, in, and um, we have uh, some growing to do. Um, but I think people are getting more interested in other people's religions. So I think maybe that's a little bit safer thing to do Yeah. I think on that same line, I have a question for you all, if that's okay. I don't mean to sure. bust the system, but, you know, I know our team got some practice around that related to um, the killing of George Floyd and James Scurlock this summer. And we had a member of our team at the time whose husband worked on um, a, a police force. And they were very different sides in that case. And so it wasn't necessarily around religion, but it was, hey, how do we have this conversation? Or even around the recent insurrection um, in early January, how do we have this conversation knowing that people are on different sides um, and that we need to foster it so that way we're having the conversation, but that way we need to foster it in a way that we leave respecting each other's opinions and still disagreeing but still having that respect and trust with one another rather than um, leading to the character, anything inappropriate, really stating um, why we believe what we do, which is really not that far off. So I'm just curious back to you all, have you seen this application within your organizations and employers, even based on um, hopefully an awakening around race relations? And could that be applied then to conversations around religion and spirituality? Anyone want to answer that before I respond? Well, I mean, <laughs> go for it, Michelle. I'm totally biased because I work at Tri Faith. Um, but that's actually one of the things I love about Tri Faith is one of our goals is, you know, we're trying to equip 
employers and employees to be able to have those kind of conversations in the workplace and devoid and avoid, you know, people hating each other and HR issues and all of that jazz. Um, and I do think at TriFaith, um, Wendy obviously is the ED, um, she does a great job allowing us the space to participate in those conversations um, at our own pace and with what we're comfortable with. Can I make one more? Please. I don't want to take everybody's time. Last I one. know that and I can't remember if it was one of the TriFaith or one of the things through Temple, but discussion came up about uh, these conversations with our neighbors. And a neighbor that you might be a really good friend with and you love dearly, they've been your neighbor for years, but you know that they are absolutely polar opposite on politics. And there are certain things that you can still be a friend, but you can't discuss. Yeah, you know, my, my mom um, and I had this conversation about whether or not you could marry someone who was of a different political party than you. And my, my mom did, right? Like she and my father's po politics were different. And my daughter's like, I could never consider having a bedfellow who was, um, you know, of, of different political mind than me. And so um, we have become so polarized on these conversations that we um, can't hear each other and, and that's broken. Um, Anne, I, I'd love you to have a, a chance to give your hand raised again, but we're, we're just about done. Sure, um, just really quick, because I think it's important to this, uh, what we're saying, and I know Pride Faith is lucky to have uh, Wendy um, leading the charge, so this might not be new, um, but I think when we begin to have these discussions, when we have polarizing points of view, it's really important to do a lot of stuff before we start having the conversation. Uh, number one, think about agreements uh, that everyone, there's this, uh, you may know of those, like trying something new on, listening from someone else's perspective. So I work with um, 10 wonderful ones that I sneak in all the time. Um, and also just work, uh, somatic work, um, how to calm our nervous system, how to take a deep breath, how to step back. And then of course, all sorts of lovely mindful communication uh, tips that really honor, you know, um, and create a vocabulary and space for these important conversations. So thank you for letting me share that. Wow. Um, thank you for your wisdom. Um, Sarah, thank you. Thank you for joining us today and thank you everyone for for showing up um the path ahead of us is is long and um i think that um this cold spell um that we're waking up from um perhaps is an opportunity for us to remember um that the warmth and the heat comes from in each of us and that we are all created um with beauty and, and be able to find a space and place and, and hold that space for people who are different from us is such an important part of our work. And so um, thank you mostly for showing up today. Thank you for your um, generous message, Sarah. And um, stay warm, take care. Thank Sending you. you lots of love. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you, Wendy. Bye-bye. Thank, Thank you, this was wonderful. Thank you, Sarah.